uh, i am a member of founding member of functional neurological disorders and uh, he has been working very close to dr hallett who is the president of the foundation and uh, i have uh, some interactions with uh, dr john stone and uh, during mds meeting he has been presenting some wonderful talks so i am very sure that uh, all the listeners from india are going to be benefited by his wonderful presentation welcome dr john thank you very much sanjay it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation so i'm going to talk i think i'm going to talk for about 25 to 30 minutes and then we will the, then the plan is for questions i'm aware that this is a this is a topic where um, questions and discussion are very important so i'm going to focus on the screen now i uh, hope i hope everyone can hear me and see me all right we are That's better. Yes. right so I've called this, this is, this is called FND, turning a negative into a positive because functional disorders for most neurologists are something that often pr provokes a rather heavy heart. People feel rather negative about the condition, about patients who have it, um, about treatment. And I'm going to try and persuade you that, that none of those things are necessary, really. This is a condition that we can diagnose positively, that we can uh, make positive uh, explanations for patients and uh, successful treatments. So just some resources. Uh, this is the handbook of clinical neurology that uh, I co-edited with Mark Hallett and Alan Carson a couple of years ago. If you might find it in your in a university or hospital subscription, but if you don't, send me an email and I can send that to you. And I'd also recommend this JAMA Neurology Review uh, that, I, that I was involved with as well uh, with an international group. Um, a couple of years ago. Some other resources here about uh, covering very much the, the area of my talk today, which is trying to make the neurological assessment um, a treatment opportunity from the, from the beginning, um, right from the start when you're beginning to take the history, and, uh, and an article we wrote for there for Practical Neurology about thinking about how to talk to patients John, about functional John, can I interrupt you? We are not yeah. seeing your screen. Are you not? Ah. Oh. So I think you'll have to start sharing and. Oh dear. Sorry. Right. Okay. There we go. Yes. Okay. How's that? Yes. Yes. We, we can see. Okay. That. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. So there, there's me. There's the book, the handbook, um, the JAMA Neurology, and the other articles. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So these are some of my key points today, really, which is that you, the FND is a diagnosis you should make on positive grounds. It's not about doing a bunch of tests which are normal. That's, that's bad medicine. That's bad neurology. It's about making a positive diagnosis. And when you realize that, then it enables you to make a diagnosis of FND and another neurological condition, which is, a, again, a crucial thing. It's, this is not about either or. Many patients have both FND and another disorder, for example, Parkinson's or epilepsy. Um, and don't make this diagnosis just because uh, someone is an, uh, has a psychiatric problem or because you haven't, it's bizarre or you haven't seen it before. Again, that's bad neurology. So this is a video of a patient called Rachel, uh, who I saw in my clinic, and she took part in a short film that we made which you can access on the website I've made, neurosymptoms.org. And she's just talking, you can see in this clip that she has a functional right hemiparesis with some uh, functional dystonia of her hand and also her foot. In an ideal health service, all doctors and professionals would be actually made aware of this. And um, we wouldn't be treated as so, not like we're faking, but almost like as so it's not real. Um, and that doesn't really help us because we're thinking, oh, what's, what's wrong with me? So functional disorders are everywhere in medicine. They are extraordinarily common, um, probably making up a roughly around um, a quarter to a third of all outpatient consultations in most specialties. So if you think about irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, uh, they're really common and that's really not represented in most medical training or uh, textbooks or curricula. And this is what we're talking about today in neurology, the kind of symptoms that we see uh, as neurologists, weakness, numbness, 
dissociative attacks particularly I'm going to focus on. This is a study that we did uh, across Scotland led by Alan Carson just showing what is it that neurologists in Scotland at least are doing and my experience talking to neurologists around the world is that these numbers don't vary that much from place to place. Um, that, that functional disorders were the second commonest reason to see uh, to have a new neurology outpatient appointment in Scotland in this study and that includes these patients we're talking about today are also very common uh, even though many people outside of neurology think that this is a rare problem it really isn't it's a common cause of disability and symptoms particularly in younger people when we looked at those nearly 4,000 uh, patients we found that uh, self-rated physical disability was the same in people where the neurologist said that look this patient doesn't we don't think this patient does have a structural pathophysiological disease that we can see their disability was just the same as patients where the neurologist thought there was a clear structural explanation so um, there's very little correlation between the diagnosis that we make uh, and levels of physical disability and as you might predict higher rates of uh, problems like anxiety and depression so these patients have same amounts of disability, but, but extra problems with uh, anxiety and depression. The other thing that people often say is, well, okay, there's lots of these patients, but perhaps we should uh, not worry too much about them. Perhaps we shouldn't medicalize them. Uh, they'll, perhaps they'll get better if we, if we just don't, if we do ignore them. And what these studies have shown is that simply is not the case. These patients who present to us with functional motor disorders uh, tend to have symptoms that last for a long time. So we recently did a study in Edinburgh over 14 years and found that 80% of patients presenting with functional limb weakness still had symptoms 14 years later. Still, they still had the symptom of weakness. So do you asked me to cover a little bit about assessment. Um, it, it wasn't a huge amount of time for that, but these are some, some things that I put in this article about the assessment as treatment ways in which if you think you're dealing with and if, in fact this probably applies to all patients to be honest but particularly the patients with functional disorders how can you make the assessment therapeutic from the onset well i think asking making sure you've you've recorded and asked about all of the symptoms particularly fatigue and dizziness is important thinking about mechanism particularly as neurologists thinking about how, why has this patient got a weak leg or why are they having uh, seizures Thinking about that a bit more than what sort of vulnerabilities does this patient have, which I think can wait for later on. Uh, why is the patient seeing you now? What do they think is wrong? What, have, what kind of experiences have they had with doctors before you? Um, patients with FND have often had very negative experiences of being disbelieved or ridiculed um, or people jumping to conclusions about their neurological symptoms based on psychological factors. So these are some ideas, really. Uh, all of that does take time, but I think there's value in taking the time to do it properly. It's, it can save time later on. So but ultimately, you make a diagnosis of a FND based on positive features of the diagnosis. I'm going to run through some of those now. So uh, this, first of all, limb weakness. So you can see here a photograph from the 19th century of a patient with um, a functional left hemiparesis and you can see they're dragging their leg with the hip slightly externally rotated the toe in contact with the ground so that's the that's the feature that you're looking for it's not all patients but when the when the functional paralysis is more severe either the hip is externally rotated or internally rotated most commonly this is a video taken from world war one patient with shell shock um, and there this shows them before and after being treated by um Arthur Hurst, a neurologist in Devon. You see the patients dragging their leg. And uh, then they had some treatment and you can see a lot better. So what was it that Arthur Hurst was doing there? I've, I've certainly learned a lot by reading uh, material from that period. I think neurologists at that stage knew a lot about treating these disorders. They regarded it as a condition within their specialty. Shortly after that, that changed and it became a condition that neurologists felt, well, this is, this is nothing to do with us. The patient just needs to see a psychiatrist. So I think I would argue that we should be returning to a situation where neurologists take ownership 
for this interesting problem. This is Rachel again. Uh, she's got a, I'm showing here hip abductor sign of functional leg weakness. So she's got right-sided uh, weakness. And I'm testing, this is something you can do with a patient sitting down, demonstrate to relatives. Uh, apologies for the piano sound here. I don't have a lounge bar pianist in my clinic room, but it was added on afterwards. So can I just get you to push against my hand here? And we can see when we do that, you're stronger than I am, yeah. and I can't push that knee in. Um, and then I want, let's try and do the same thing with this knee. So stop me from pushing in, push out as strong as you can. But I'm winning there, yeah. pushing your knee in. Let's go back to this side. I want you to push out again as hard as you can. Really stop me, push, 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 push. Now when we do that, we can see that actually what's happening over on the right side is that I can't, it's become much stronger and I can't push the knee in now. Mm -hmm. So it's brought out the automatic movement. So the, the principles of positive diagnosis for motor disorders is, is the demonstration of normal automatic movement in the presence of abnormal voluntary movement. Um, and uh, so the hip abductor sign is a nice way of doing that. Press this heel into the ground as hard this as you can. Which is the other sign, so this is Lucy. Uh, she has weakness again of her right side and you'll see that she has hip, weakness of hip extension on the right and but it returns to normal with, con with contralateral hip flexion against resistance and you can see as well I'm doing it here with the patient sitting down which again I think is a slightly better way of doing it that enables the, you to explain the sign to the patient and push this heel into the ground as hard as you can that's weak, okay. And then um, just lift this knee up for me. Keep it in the air. Stop me from pressing down. Focus on that leg. Really stop me from pressing down. And when you if we do that, you can feel that the right leg returns yeah. to normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's good. So you can see both of those uh, patients. I'm also I'm showing the patient the sign. I'm not using this as a, f a form of trickery. I'm not sort of. I think I think the, the, in the past neurologists have often kept these signs rather secret uh, and wouldn't have dreamt of sharing, with, sharing them with the patient. In fact, I think it's one of the most helpful things you can do is demonstrate to the patient what you're doing, how you're making the diagnosis, and that automatic movements uh, can be normal. And that's what you're trying to achieve with treatment. This is a patient with functional tremor, a video from Mark Edwards' group. Um, and what this shows here is this very simple idea of um, just asking the patient to copy um, this movement that you're making with your uh, thumb and forefinger, speed it up and then slow it down and see what happens to their tremor. Um, at the beginning of this clip, the, uh, the, the examiner is using mental arithmetic to try and distract the tremor, but it's not really working. E 86, 79. 72. So you can see here that when the patient's trying to copy the movement, the tremor transiently stops, it entrains to the same rhythm briefly, and it stops again. And sometimes patients just have trouble copying the movement, and that as well is a and here's some pause with ballistic movements. Functional dystonia uh, presents typically with a clenched fist um, or uh, an inverted plantar flexed ankle, as you can see here. It's a very disabling problem. This patient uh, is, is like, many, like many patients with disorder. If you ask them to close their eyes and tell you what position their foot is in, uh, they'll often have a sense that the foot is in a normal position. Um, and this is one way of helping the patient to understand that the problem is in their brain rather than their foot. When you look at the foot, you can see that it's bent, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Can you just close your eyes for me now? And just tell me what that left foot feels like with your eyes shut. It feels like it's straight. Okay. It feels completely straight. Yeah. Okay. And then when you open your eyes and you look at it again. And then I can see it's bent. Yeah. Although... So is that how? What is that? Is that a strange feeling? That difference between? Yes, it, it feels it feels strange because, um, although the foot's bent and I know it's bent, 
Street. So these kinds of conversations are telling us something quite interesting, I think, about these disorders, that they are at one level uh, disorders of distorted bodily awareness, perception, uh, agency, um, and hopefully things that, that as neurologists that can start to make us feel more confident that this is a disorder within our own domain. The functional dystonia uh, and other functional motor disorders link uh, overlap very strongly with uh, motor and sensory features of complex regional pain syndrome and that's, a, that's something that we have an interest in, wrote that article about if you'd want to read more. This is a gentleman with uh, functional gait disorder um, and like many patients, I think well, whilst these conditions can be overdiagnosed in patients, younger female patients, those with psychiatric problems, they're sometimes underdiagnosed in older men without those conditions and I think this is an example of that. This man had been around the uh, different specialists for about three years with this abnormal gait and back pain. It feels like I am manually trying to get my legs to move as opposed yeah. to them wanting to do it of their own volition. Okay. So I'm having to think through what it is I'm trying to do as opposed to just doing it naturally. Okay. So he's saying, I'm having to think through what I'm doing as opposed to do it naturally. He's actually telling us about the mechanism of his own disorder there. And what, I'm, what I then ask him to do is something quite simple, which is just pretend that uh, you're ice skating. Um, it's a different motor program. And let's see what happens. Can I see you yeah. sliding? Yeah. You can see when he's making ice skating type movements, his gait is much more normal. He doesn't have that abnormal that forward flexion. Try and walk backwards towards yeah. me. So walking backwards is the one which is really weird because it's not really natural. It's not like that's something I normally do walk backwards now. Yeah, okay. No, that's, that's, I mean, that was a bit of a revelation to be honest because I'm not having to think about it. Yeah. So again, a simple examination uh, technique, but one that reveals to the patient the fact they do have can have automatic normal movements and that we use that in physiotherapy and we, we discuss these signs very explicitly as part of his treatment. Now this is a patient having a dissociative uh, non-epileptic attack. This the, the issue here is that it's not about things that are not epilepsy, this is about features which clearly indicate this is a dissociative attack. His eyes are tightly closed, he's got side to side head movements, the movements are tremor like he's hyperventilating, it's, it's a long duration of his stay. There are multiple positive features here of a dissociative attack, um, which should enable us to make the diagnosis. And we should be trying to get away from calling things by what they're not, rather than uh, calling what they are. And, these are the sorts of tables that you'll see in papers about FND. I haven't got time to go through them in detail, but mainly just think about the eyes. Are the eyes open or closed? That's the most helpful thing. And also the duration. About 25% of patients with dissociative attacks have events where they fall down, lie still with their eyes closed for more than two minutes. I would argue there's nothing else in medicine that makes someone have all of those clinical features. And many patients have a lot of unnecessary investigations because simply Doctors are not aware of that uh, common uh, clinical combination. Many things can happen during dissociative attacks that make people think about epilepsy uh, or syncope, but are not, uh, particularly injury, which is quite common. Uh, tongue biting does occur quite commonly. Incontinence does occur. People have these things on their own as well. So just a few minutes on um, what's going on in these patients. How are, how are they developing these symptoms? Well. Well, there are plenty of uh, functional imaging studies now showing that there are, there are changes in these patients' brains that are different to uh, patients who are pretending to have these symptoms. So this is one of the nicest ones, I think, from Mark Hallett's group, showing hypoactivation in the right temporoparietal junction, which is a node in a network involved in agency. So, this suggests that yes, the patient's using their voluntary movement system, but the brain scans are telling us what the patient's telling us, which is it doesn't feel like them that's doing it. Uh, there's a loss of agency over the movement. 
This is a patient who has recurrent functional hemiparesis. I could hear you saying things, but they just seem... And what she's talking about here is an, the episodic sensation of dissociation, the feeling of being spaced out, not with it, a sort of out-of-body experience. And this is a very helpful uh, clinical thing to look for and one that can help you explain the mechanism back to their patient. So every time she got this functional hemiparesis, she would experience this out-of-body feeling. And then I can explain back to her, but what's happening is you're having an out-of-body experience and only half of your body is coming back. These are, these are ways that we can start to make sense of our patient symptoms. You just go move on my head. I wanted to answer you, but couldn't really answer you. Yeah. I just felt you were uh, yeah. That's a very good. And uh, help patients with it because they have trouble explaining it. They're worried about talking about it because it sounds a bit mad, but it's not mad. Oliver Sachs, I would argue, had also had functional paralysis, and he had it after a very common scenario, which is after physical injury. Uh, he had a ruptured quadriceps tendon. He wrote a whole book about uh, feelings of alienation from his limb afterwards. Uh, lovely description here of how his limb did not feel like his. It felt alien and incomprehensible, not part of me, even though he knew it was part of him. And this is the kind of experience that patients with functional paralysis have. So, um, but why do people get this? Well, lots of reasons. Uh, and this is a, a sort of typical biopsychosocial model. What we need to do with this, however, is to be able to say, re recognize that there are patients in whom uh, psychological factors are relevant, uh, that they've had adverse experience, they've had experiences that make them prone to dissociation uh, or anxiety. And we've shown that in a Lancet review here, looking at adverse experience, although the rates of those things are similar really to depression and anxiety. And that there are plenty of patients who have not had those experiences. So look for it at some point, perhaps not the first time you meet a patient, but don't insist on it. Many people have not had these experiences and it's actually uh, really unhelpful and traumatic to insist that they must have done. So it's a bit like uh, looking for uh, when someone's had a stroke, you might ask them about smoking, but if they tell you that they're not a smoker, don't go on about it. Accept what the patient tells you. Um, it's, not, it's a risk factor, not the cause. And in fact, having another uh, neurological condition is probably just as important in terms of uh, risk factors as psychological factors. And there are patients, like the gentleman I showed you with the gait disorder, where there really was no psychological or psychosocial uh, factor going on. So I'm, I'm, I'm aware of time here and I want to get to treatment. So I'm going to skip past this. You can maybe look at this on the video. But so we have models now of how we can bring together etiology and mechanism in th thinking about predisposing factors, thinking about triggering events, often physical triggering events. Depression, anxiety, comorbidities, they're not part of the disorder. And there are various things that make it last longer, like doctors not believing patients, being in diagnostic limbo, unnecessary tests and treatment. So let's get on to treatment finally. Um, this is a model that we produced for uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And one of the radical ideas in this was to say that the, the neurologist is a part of treatment. The neurologist is not there just to uh, exclude disease and send the patient somewhere else. It's the neurologist that's in the key position to explain the diagnosis, triage the patient, think what does this patient need now? What might they benefit from? Now, explanation goes wrong in many different ways. Um, doctors often focus on tests. I've explained this as a clinical diagnosis. It's not uh, a diagnosis that you make just because tests are normal. So patients do need tests. It's very important to do them. You're looking for that neurological disease that the patient may have as well. But don't do them in a serial fashion. Just do them all at once and stop. Um, Many doctors emphasize to the patient what they don't have with words like non-organic, medically unexplained. This is often not helpful because patients want to know what they have, not what they don't have. And if they've got a paralyzed leg, they must have something. This is another way that doctors may try and present the diagnosis, saying you've got a psychological problem, it's caused by stress. I've explained to you that, that the psychological factors can be important, but they're not the only factor. So, 
explaining it like this is a bit like saying to a patient with stroke, you have smokogenic paralysis. Your paralysis is caused by smoking. And saying that to everybody with a stroke, whether they've been a smoker or not, it, it's not helpful. And it tends to induce this sort of response from patients. They feel they're being got at. They feel they're being accused of making the symptoms up. And everyone's unhappy, including the doctor. So just think very carefully about the way that you talk to patients. What should we do instead? What I would argue is that we just do what you normally do when you explain a condition to someone. So start by telling the patient what they have and use the term that you're comfortable with, but just tell them what they have, not what they don't have. Patients often are pleased just to be told that, they, that there is something wrong and the doctor knows what it is. You might need to say this at some point, particularly if they've had bad experiences from other patients, from other doctors. Show them their uh, motor signs. So uh, as I did in those videos earlier, show the patient how when they're trying to make the movement, it doesn't work. When they're distracted, it does work. That's showing us the nature of the problem. It's a problem with uh, the voluntary nervous system, but not the automatic uh, nervous system. Emphasize that this is a, a, a problem to do with the software more than the hardware. Uh, we, the, the signs are telling us that there isn't damage to the brain, but they're telling us that the brain is not functioning properly. That's why it's called a functional neurological disorder. And software and hardware is often a good analogy. So what I'm suggesting here is really what you do anyway for all the other conditions that you see. If you're telling someone you've got Parkinson's disease, then just tell them the, the name of the condition, tell them the typical features that are helping you to make that diagnosis. Talk about mechanism first. The why is more complicated. Why do people get Parkinson's disease, MS? We don't really know, it's complicated. Functional disorders, also complicated. So I think it goes wrong because people do something weird and different when they should just do what they normally do. The provision of information, this is the website I've made for patients, is of some help but don't expect the provision of information alone to make someone better. They need more than that. The, the information is just the start. I, I, I like to hand patients fact sheets because you know, many patients don't have, may not have the internet, not sure how to find things. You need to make sure you've handed over the information carefully and in a way that's helpful for that patient. We now have lots of helpful FND charities and support organizations which are helping to reinforce these messages for patients and we're working well together. So if you see the patient again, sometimes it's really rewarding. The patient's delighted to have met someone who understands what's wrong and uh, has helped them make sense of their symptoms. They then are able to be empowered to uh, start their own process of self-help and rehabilitation. That doesn't always happen. Uh, these are difficult conditions for patients to get their head around. There may be many, obstacles to recovery. Sometimes you need to go back around that circle. Um, physiotherapy is probably, I think, the treatment of choice initially for patients with functional motor disorders. You can see here a patient with, uh, who's uh, putting a lot of weight on their crutches, can't move their legs. And here they're having physio from two physios who really know about FND and they know ways in which to try and promote automatic movements over voluntary ones. The physio is different to what you might use for stroke or MS where you might ask the patient to focus on their limbs. Here you want them to use distraction in an explicit and positive way. And sometimes you do get very good outcomes. So we published our recommendations for physiotherapy uh, in JNMP. Glenn Nielsen's led a clinical trial with very good uh, preliminary outcomes for, these intervention, for this intervention compared to patients' controls having the same amount of physiotherapy. But we can all do a form of cognitive therapy, which is to help people change their minds about what's wrong. If they come into the clinic thinking they've got MS and they go out of the clinic thinking, oh, perhaps I haven't got MS, perhaps I've got that strange functional thing they were talking about, you've made a big difference. And for dissociative attacks, getting the cross to the patient they're having something a bit like panic attacks they're not panic attacks but they are similar episodes of losing control and perhaps there are treatments that can help them regain control and here's a, a clinical trial of that from laura goldstein's group in london which again was encouraging and there's a larger trial about to report so i'm run out of time here i think
Uh, so it's a positive diagnosis, not one of exclusion. We can share these positive signs with patients, use them in treatment. The neurologist is incredibly important in initiating, supervising treatment and referral. Our models are much broader than the ones we've been used to. They're not just psychological. There's a whole range of potential mechanisms. Um, and the treatment is also multidisciplinary. So I will stop there, Sudhir, and I'm, uh, and I'm going to stop my sharing my screen as well so I can see everybody. I hope that you can still hear me. Everyone's yes. very quiet. Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. So, so, yeah, so great. So thanks very much for that. A very nice talk, John, and I have some questions. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you will answer those. Uh, the first question is how to make interaction fruitful when we have little time in our clinic because we have very busy clinics and so how to make interaction fruitful? I know, yeah, it is. And I, you know, I appreciate, I mean, I, I have half an hour for a new patient, which is a luxury and I have longer sometimes. I think just focusing down on the things that really matter. So, you know, obviously you've got to make, you've got to spend time making sure that you're, you're confident with the diagnosis. Getting those lists of symptoms out doesn't take long. Uh, you know, fatigue, do you have dizziness, do you have sleep disturbance? Finding out what, what does the patient think's wrong and then showing them the signs and saying, look, you've got this condition, it's called FND, here's some information. Though I would focus on those key elements and then maybe uh, if you can see the patient again, because I think that's, that's something that I, that I know many neurologists don't do. There's such an opportunity there to make a difference if you do see them again. Uh, after you've provided information. Uh, one of my fellow Anjali, she has asked one question that what is the difference in alien limb and functional neurological disorder as sense of agency is lost in both? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they are, yeah, there is a clear overlap there, isn't there? In fact, um, you know, you talk, you're talking to a patient with cortical basal degeneration recently who, who talked about their limb in a very similar way. I think we are dealing sometimes with similar subjective experiences, but one has arisen from a structural disease pathology and one has a, arisen from a disorder of, of uh, brain functioning. So um, I think they can be very similar. But the alien limb is more that the limb is doing its, that, that's more that it's doing its own thing without the patient and it's often purposeful actions and you don't often see that in FND. There is another question by uh, Rajiv, and he's asking, "How do you know that the patient is not malingering?" Yes, well, this is a this is an old chestnut for neurologists, and in fact, it's one reason why neurologists have not been interested in this problem. I think you just have to make your own mind up. Uh, assuming that patients with FND are malingering is a good way for neurologists to not feel bad about this problem, or or not feel bad about the fact they're not very good at dealing with it. So uh, I, would, I would challenge your uh, people you, you know, to think about that yourself. Are you using the excuse of malingering because this is a problem that you find hard to deal with? I think most people who work in this field uh, do not think these patients are malingering. It simply wouldn't make sense of the very large numbers of patients that we see all presenting with similar presentations. They've done so over time. If you go back to the 19th century, they looked the same then as well. And they're the same all over the world, in my experience. They may have different attributions, but the symptoms are the same. The functional brain imaging studies help us with that question a little bit. So do neurophysiological studies, uh, differential response in randomized trials. Malingering is simply not a good explanation for what's going on here. And um, I would try and just put that to one side. You will have, there are, there are patients who, who do willfully exaggerate. Occasionally there are patients with frank malingering, particularly legal cases, they're rare. I'm not worried if I'm caught out by them because it's a much greater mistake to um, uh, think that someone's malingering when they're not. Uh, so I'll just, uh, I think it's a very important point what you said because if the neurologist thinks that the patient is malingering, then subconsciously you get angry with the patient, you don't want to help the patient and you don't have sympathy for the patient. And Absolutely. like you said, it is safest to assume that he's not malingering. Uh, 99 times out of 100, probably you would be right. Maybe there is one malingerer, but it's okay. 
So I think, and we're dealing with, we, we, we have a disorder of the voluntary nervous system. So it does, it can look like malingering because it's a disorder of voluntary movement. Um, so that's, I, but I think you really have to talk to patients about their own subjective experiences and decide for yourself, uh, how did this patient know about dissociation? How did they know to have those, you know, to, and to have this, this particular clustering of symptoms that's so familiar to me? Um, uh, I, I, again, I'm just interrupting. Uh, when we, uh, as undergraduates, when we used to think that the patient is malingering, we would often ridicule the patient or sometimes if I had a patient with functional paraplegia, we would purposely start uh, intravenous drip, give him a diuretic and then wait for him to, you know, it was actually cruel. So. Indeed. I think we really need to think about our professionalism uh, when it comes to those sorts of things. And I, you know, I, and it's a very common response. It's, I think it's a physician's response to a, a problem that they don't really understand. Um, and of course that, that it comes on to issues like the use of placebo, particularly when placebo or injections can sometimes stop seizures or transiently stop movements. Well, that's because you're, when you're dealing with placebo, you're dealing with quite powerful issues within the brain that you're potentially manipulating. Okay, go ahead, Sanjay. Hello? Sanjay, next question. I can't hear Sanjay. Okay, uh, so, uh, yes, huh, Sanjay, you can ask the question. Oh. Uh, I Hello. Think Hello. Sorry. I am not able to listen to you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I'll ask the next question. What are the red flags that psychologists should look out for during treatment? When should we send the patient back to the neurologist for further evaluation and or treatment? So this is a nice, psychologist. That's a nice question. I think what many the mistake that many neurologists make is that they they see, they see the patient, they make a diagnosis, and if they do have a psychologist or psychiatrist to send them to, which often there isn't, I know, but they'll just send them there without thinking, is this the right time for this patient to be seeing a psychologist? It's no good sending someone to a psychologist for therapy for their seizures, for example, if the patient themselves, if if you haven't done your job in explaining the diagnosis to the patient and getting them to the point where they understand it and they have some confidence in what's wrong. So I would not send a patient for therapy until I think the patient's reasonably confident about the diagnosis. And I'm also clear that they're, they, 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 they're motivated for therapy. They want to see the physio, they want to see the psychologist. So just ask those two questions before you send the patient. As a therapist, if you've got a patient in front of you is adamant that the diagnosis is wrong and or where there's multiple obstacles to treatment that are really obvious from your conversation, then it may not be the right time for therapy. Um, so those are, those are things that I'm particularly focusing on. So uh, I think I used to make a mistake. I would tell a patient that uh, I feel there is some uh, psychological issue involved. Why don't you go and speak to uh, this uh, psychologist? And if at the end of it, you come back and say that there is nothing psychological, then I will look again. So that is wrong. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I mean, it depends. Again, it depends what the patient thinks. I mean, if the patient thinks, okay, well, uh, perhaps I do need to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd like to do that. Perhaps there's something I want the need to find out about myself. But don't push it on the patient, ask them, have a discussion with them. Um, and uh, again, it's, and, and finding psychological causes as such or risk factors doesn't necessarily help treatment in the same way that once you've had your stroke, it doesn't necessarily help, help to find out you used to be a smoker. Um, so I think we need to have a much less simplistic view of uh, cause and effect here. Um, and think about, is this someone who, where psychological treatment is actually going to help their symptoms? Am I sending them to a psychologist who can help them understand their symptoms better? Many psychologists, psychiatrists are not familiar with this area and they don't really know how to um, discuss the actual, don't realize they can treat the actual symptoms, they can treat the seizures. Uh, and patients will often get into a battle there where they'll, they'll go along to the psychologist just to prove that they're, that they're not crazy because they haven't really felt believed in the first place. 
Sanjay, your uh, audio is started. Yes, my audio is started. And uh, there was another question that how to differentiate functional blindness. Yes, so there's a number of, um, I mean, actually, functional blindness and visual symptoms have a range of tests that enable you to make that diagnosis. Uh, with a, quite a high degree of confidence. So if someone's completely blind, for example, you can do things like ask them to sign their name or touch their fingers in front of them, which a blind person actually can do. Uh, if, they, if they've if they got uh, problems with one eye, there are tests that uh, an ophthalmologist can do. There's a fogging test where you progressively fog the good eye and demonstrate that the person can see with their bad eye. Um, so uh, there's a range of tests there. But that, that area has not been developed very well in terms of thinking about treatment uh, or talking about discussing these tests with patients. Any role of visual potentials? Well, to some extent, although again, you're, you're dealing with a test there that's demonstrating uh, the absence of a condition rather than the presence of one. So we have to think about tests that demonstrate the internal inconsistency that show that a patient cannot see and then show that they can. That, that's how you make a diagnosis of FND. So you might do visual evoke potentials to see if they've got anything else as well. You have to be careful with them because patients, if they're not fixating properly, you, you might have a false positive result as well. So they're not that helpful, I think. Uh, ERG can be more helpful, and of course, MRI brain, because you, want to, what, you have to think about things like cortical blindness that can look like functional visual loss. Another uh, problem is uh, by the recent tremor classification and essential pa palatal tremor patients having ear click, they're now being more diagnosed as a functional disorder. What is mm. your take on that? Yeah, I've, I've had a few patients with functional palatal tremor. Um, what you need to do there, if it's an unusual presentation, obviously, but if, if you see it and someone's got a clicking sound in their head, you can try and use uh, um, entrainment ask the patient to um, tap, do this with their fingers, or sometimes if they move their tongue from side to side, that will, what's been found is that many patients with palatal tremor have a distractible uh, movement disorder, which is surprising and interesting. Um, I've managed to treat some patients uh, in the same way. Uh, so I think there is, there is a, obviously there are patients with palatal tremor who have brainstem issues as well. So. Um, and I think some of them, some of those patients with functional palatal tremor probably have other milder disturbances in anatomically in that area as well. Another uh, issue where, that is very typical in India is the emotional stress is little different uh, because there is a lot of school stress in children and there is a lot yep. of financial straight, uh, stress in males. Uh, so Sorry. how to deal with that? Sorry, a lot of what stress in males? Like the financial stress, uh, like the stress related to the money, or oh, yeah. the job, or maybe empl employment. Well, I think those are all the same stresses that, that we see in Scotland as well, to be honest, but obviously at different levels probably in, in India. But um, yeah, I mean, stress is, is everywhere, isn't it? I mean, look at the world at the moment. Uh, so the presence of stress, very importantly, shouldn't, it shouldn't lead you to the diagnosis because it's so common. Um, but stress can be very relevant. If someone's very stressed, they're not sleeping, they might be more exhausted, they're more prone to dissociation. Um, it is a common uh, vulnerability factor. So look into, you know, if I think it's important to look into these things, but once you've got a good relationship with a patient, once that you have addressed the main issue, which is what on earth is causing these seizures? What on earth is the mechanism of, these, of this weak leg? In my experience, patients with FND are very happy to talk about stress and actually want to talk about stress. But once you've got past that level and not jumping into that as an initial um, cause, because for the patient, that's simply, you know, how does bullying at school make my leg weak? You know, you need to sort of join that gap somehow. Uh, John, we've yeah. got I think almost 40, 50 questions and some of them are very interesting. Uh, I don't know if you can take them faster because we would want some... Okay, answers. I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. Or, or can we email you and you reply at least? That somebody has asked, for example, can a neonate get uh, FND? No, I would say to that. Okay, go ahead, uh, Sanjay. 
So the second question is uh, that should all patients be admitted? That gives a better result. No, I think there are there there are situations where admission is helpful if someone's got very severe disability that can't be with outpatient therapy is clearly not going to work. Um, I think admission can be very helpful, uh, but most people can be managed as outpatients, I would say. There is another question coming from Helisa Ahmedabad that uh, when to consider starting antidepressant and antipsychotics uh, in uh, this type of patients? Is there any yeah. role? Antipsychotics anti hardly ever. There's a very little overlap, I think, between psychosis and FND. Um, I think there are interesting reasons for that. Antidepressants uh, can have a role in patients who have depression and have anxiety. And, and you know, 40, 50 percent of patients will have one of those two conditions. Uh, but they're not, there's no evidence that they help the actual FND symptoms themselves yet. They might do, the particularly seizures, but don't just slap people on antidepressants just because they've got FND. Treat the comorbidities, try and be evidence-based. Akash is asking that uh, what percentage of patients get better and uh, how many percentage get relapsed once they are better? So uh, enough patients get better to make me want to keep doing it uh, would be one answer to that. Um, and certainly more, more of my patients get better with FND than they do with uh, my patients with MS. Um, th these are relapsing disorders and it's important to talk about that with patients if someone does have a dramatic recovery, I tend to talk about relapse, the possibility of relapse and how to manage that. So I think the treatment studies are encouraging um, and they're, they're more encouraging than the natural history. So this is one of the treatable disorders in a neurological setting. We should be thinking of it like uh, B12 deficiency or thyroid problems. We should look for it because you know, many of our conditions are not treatable. This is one of the ones that is treatable. I think this would be the last question, but very important question, how to differentiate frontal lobe epilepsy uh, with PNES? Yes, so I didn't have, yeah, I mean, there are many things, many areas, pitfalls uh, that you have to watch out for. Frontal lobe epilepsy is one of them because frontal lobe epilepsy presents with attacks that can look, in quotes, behavioral. Uh, people would be thrashing their arms about, they appear to be conscious, they might even be aware and conscious. The difference is that in frontal lobe epilepsy, the events are brief. Uh, they're, um, it's, a, it's the shortness of them. And in fact, in some ways, it's the, it's the weirdness of them. So if something's very weird, don't think FND. Think actually this is more likely to be a neurological disease. So, but it's, it's the briefness that you're looking for. And obviously, in that situation, EEG is important. Um, but again, be careful, EEG doesn't always detect, um, surface EEG doesn't always detect uh, deep epileptic foci. So you've got to look at the semiology, really. John, uh, can you ex just tell in brief, very simply, what is the biopsychosocial model? Because uh, I know it's a long question, but uh, in very short, this thing, what, what is the biopsychosocial model? Well, it's a model that really, it's not just for functional disorders, it's for all conditions. It's just getting across the idea when you see a patient, uh, he's got a, a functional disorder. If I, I would say, it, don't just think about psychological and social factors. Think about the fact this patient, there is a biological underpinning to this. And in FND, uh, that's commonly the triggering of these symptoms by comorbid neurological conditions like migraine. But it's also thinking about realizing that this is a disorder that you can think of at the level of the brain and there's a model whereby that works there's also there's a it's a disorder where psychological models are also relevant so we have to think about this uh, condition at multiple perspectives and hold those perspectives together at the same time it's very tempting for people to say oh well it's all a brain it's all going on in the brain without saying this is all, but this is also a condition of the person who has it. So it's putting those things together, keeping perspectives. It's not an easy thing to do. And it goes against rather dualistic ways that we think about uh, medicine in the world. You know, the brain is not divided into neurology and psychiatry. Uh, it's all one thing. Um, I know it is getting late, but there's one more question I want to ask you. And that is about secondary gain. Somebody is asking me, uh, asking you, uh, how when you find a patient who is obviously resisting you feel he's resisting getting better and wants to keep 
getting what we call the secondary gain, how do you handle this situation? Well, this is a similar answer to the malingering thing, really. Again, I think secondary gain does occur in FND, but it also occurs in other conditions. When we see it in, you know, if someone has, uh, if someone's paraplegic and they become a Paralympian, would you regard that as, or look at that patient, they are getting benefit from being disabled? We don't, we don't look at it that way. We think we, we admire that patient for uh, making the best of their disability. Um, I don't think there's any clear evidence of second, more, that there is more secondary gain in FND than there is for other neurological conditions. Again, it's another way that neurologists and have tried to deal with a problem that they're uncomfortable with. Yes, there are patients where there are major obstacles to recovery. It might be in a legal case. They might, uh, they might hate their job. Uh, their f family, wife might have left their job to look after them and it's very difficult to change things around again. But I th so I think we need to get away from uh, rather judgmental views about why people have these illnesses. So I think a very important takeaway from your thing is that don't think of malingering, don't think that there is only secondary gain. Try to be more sympathetic and think that the patient is actually suffering. Indeed, and just realize that you, the reason that you're going to those ideas is because they make it easier for you. And it makes it easier for you to not to discharge that patient that you don't really know what to do with. So I know that's a rather challenging statement, but I think that's often what's happening in the physician's mind. Okay. Thank you, John. That was a very nice uh, talk and we really enjoyed it. And I know this is just the introduction, so we are going to have you give us some more talks on this very interesting topic. Well, I, well, I, yeah, I certainly hope I can in the future. And I hope that we're, we're hoping to do a range of these webinars through the uh, FND Society as well. So that would be another way that people can uh, join in and find out more about FND. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you.